Okay, cool. Okay. Hi, my name is Brad Martyr. I'm the medical director for nephrology for Horizon Therapeutics. Uh, since uh, March of 2020. Uh, prior to that, I've been a nephrologist in clinical practice in Denver, Colorado since 2003. Uh, most of my practice was taking care of patients with kidney transplants, but I also took care of a fair number of dialysis patients, patients with chronic kidney disease, and patients with acute kidney injury in hospitalized conditions. We wanted to talk with you about your journey your journey to Horizon Therapeutics, your interest in kidney disease and gout. And uh, so um, um, let, let's start there, you know, if you don't mind. Um, you've, but you're relatively new with the company, is, is that right? That's correct. Um, you know, the company uh, has realized around the same time that I realized that gout really is not just a disease of the joints like most people assume. It's actually a disease that has a lot to do with the kidneys. And, um, you know, my personal journey, um, considering gout in my patient population of kidney transplants and patients with chronic kidney disease um, is, is, is kind of interesting in the fact that I really had um, a frustrating time dealing with gout at the beginning of my career. Um, it's a, a disease that's, um, it, it has a lot of patient complaints, pain, um, dietary issues, um, and, um, and the tools, especially when I was beginning my practice, were really not that great to take care of patients with gout and chronic kidney disease. Um, and over the years, I found that by not dealing with the disease um, uh, uh, independently, uh, that is by referring my patients' gout issues back to their primary care doctors or to rheumatologists, um, I was just simply frustrating patients who had to, uh, uh, to wait longer uh, to get uh, appropriate treatment. And also, um, many uh, healthcare providers that are not familiar with chronic kidney disease will end up starting these patients on inappropriate medications like NSAIDs or incorrect doses of medications that need to be strictly regulated for patients with chronic kidney disease. And so it was through trying to help my patients get better treatments more efficiently that I really found a better way to think about gout and a better way to treat these patients. And in fact, that became one of the most rewarding parts of my practice because so much of what a nephrologist does is just um, making improvements of numbers on pieces of paper, um, and very little uh, do we have the opportunity to actually take care of such a significant disease that patients are suffering from. And so I found by actually um, alleviating the suffering of my patients with gout, um, I was able to actually um, have a rewarding practice that um, at the end of the day, I was able to say to myself and even my teenage daughters how much benefit I was giving for, for patients who are really suffering. Um, and so that was um, something that I felt like I could benefit patients one at a time. Um, but if there's something that I could do to help educate other nephrologists on um, how to manage gout in these patients and that they could then pay that forward to help patients in the same way, that I could make actually a more substantial impact. And that's really the motivation between moving from clinical practice to my role at Horizon uh, uh, in this last year. Mm -hmm. Now, what percentage of your patients uh, then um, are, also have gout? So this is really interesting, and I always knew that I had a lot of gout patients, but when you really look at NHANES data that describes both chronic kidney disease and self-diagnosed uh, uh, gout in patients, it turns out that for patients with stage three chronic kidney disease, 25% have gout, and if chronic kidney disease moves to stage four, 33% of patients have gout. So between one quarter and one third of my patients actually had a gout diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And when you think about how many patients there are like that and what kind of impact that you can make, it's really fertile ground for nephrologists to make a difference with these patients. Right. You were saying that gout is actually, to you, a, a kidney disease. Um, it, That's exactly right. 
Um, you know, sure, most of the symptoms that patients have uh, with gout uh, takes place in peripheral joints. Um, that's generally where um, these gout flares, an inflammatory process, um, because of uric acid deposition is occurring. But the reason why uric acid is crystallizing and depositing in joints is because the kidney is not uh, eliminating it from the body like it should. And when patients have chronic kidney disease, that elimination becomes more difficult and patients end up becoming more hyperuricemic and, and this uh, uric acid ends up crystallizing not just in their joints, but in many other parts of the body. You know, when you think about it, uric acid is actually in every extracellular body fluid except for the CSF, which means that gout crystals can form in basically every tissue of the body except for the central nervous system. And so we see uric acid crystals in basically every structure of the heart, the coronary arteries, the valves. We see uric acid deposits in the eyes. We see uric acid deposits basically in all these tissues. And because uric acid crystals do cause uh, an inflammatory reaction in the body, there is chronic damage that occurs at all these places. And um, once we start to think of gout not as an intermittent condition localized to peripheral joints, but more as a progressive systemic disease of deposition and resulting inflammation, I think a lot of uh, healthcare providers, uh, be they rheumatologists, nephrologists, primary care doctors, podiatrists, or whatever, are going to think about gout a lot differently. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk about a diagnosis. If a uh, nephrologist is meeting with the patient for the first time, um, the patient uh, has kidney disease and may have signs of gout, um, what steps would you recommend in terms of uh, uh, testing, diagnosis, treatment, next steps? So I'm really glad that you brought that up because it's so important that people have a good, uh, uh, that physicians have a good way of being able to diagnose uh, gout and then appropriately treat it. Interestingly enough, um, even though the American College of Rheumatology has very stringent definitions and guidelines regarding both uh, gout uh, diagnosis and treatment, the um, uh, uh, guidelines for nephrologists uh, don't have any kind of um, um, real standing on gout um, treatment or a diagnosis. And I think that that's another way that we can really impact the lives of a lot of patients is to um, create those kinds of diagnostic and treatment guidelines that are specific to patients with uh, chronic kidney disease because they are quite different than patients who um, uh, uh, don't have uh, 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 kidney uh, issues to begin with. In, in what way are they different? Well, for example, um, in a lot of ways, gout management can't be done um, with patients with reduced kidney function like they can with normal kidney function. Um, treatments for flares, for example, which are by and large treated with NSAIDs, these medications are contraindicated for patients with advanced kidney disease because they can deteriorate kidney function further. In addition to that, patients who have um, uh, chronic kidney disease can't take all the same kinds of urate lowering therapies. Therapies that rely on the kidneys to uh, eliminate more uric acid are basically ineffective or dangerous because they can result in kidney stones. Uh, and also dosing is limited in some of these medications because um, the medications are metabolized or eliminated through the kidneys. And so do doses um, can't be done, uh, the dosing can't be done in the same way as, as normal kidney function. And then on top of that, gout is quite common in patients with kidney transplants. And in these patients, it's particularly difficult to manage because of drug interactions with the immunosuppression therapies that all patients with kidney transplants need. And so because of that, you know, we're kind of dealing with a different animal in these patients with chronic kidney disease compared to patients with normal kidney function. And I think that that's a reason that um, more specific guidelines need to be given to management of these patients. Mm -hmm. So what options do they have then for treatment? So right, um, 
The most important thing to understand uh, is that for these patients with chronic kidney disease, gout is so common. The next thing is that it's quite a bit more dangerous than we assume. Like I said, this uric acid is not just depositing in joints, but it's depositing in a lot of critical tissues that can serve to uh, propagate comorbid conditions that are shared by a lot of these patients, including diabetes and metabolic syndrome, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and even mortality is found to um, be increased uh, by uh, gout as an independent risk factor. Mm -hmm. So the critical feature is to make sure that if a patient has gout, that we are lowering the uric acid to below its solubility point in the serum. If you continue to have a concentration of uric acid in the bloodstream that's higher than 6.8 milligrams per deciliter, which is the point that uric acid actually crystallizes, you're just gonna get this ongoing deposition. You really need to get that uric acid lower, and that's reflected in the American College of Rheumatology's guidelines to lower uric acid to six or below in patients who have gout. Um, unfortunately, the therapies that we use to lower uric acid in these patients with chronic kidney disease, like I said, are limited. Treatments like allopurinol um, uh, has maximum doses in patients depending on what their kidney function is. And medications like febuxostat, there is a concern um, due to a black box warning regarding cardiovascular death use. And so it's very, um, it's very important to get this uric acid uh, lower than six. And if the options are limited, it leads um, uh, physicians to require uh, new kinds of therapies. And that's what we at Horizon are really dedicated to, um, uh, to make possible for these patients. Mm -hmm. um, Horizon uh, has a, a medication called piglodicase, which actually doesn't just work uh, like other uh, medications that block the production of uric acid, but uh, piglodicase actually metabolizes the uric acid that is in the circulation, converts it to allantone, which can be eliminated a lot easier than, than, than uric acid. And so even... Um, uh, courses of uh, piglodicase that are limited in duration can actually eliminate very efficiently large uh, volumes of deposited uric acid that have been accumulating over years or decades in a lot of these patients with chronic kidney disease. And, um, and that uh, is in the end required for, uh, for patients that uh, have been living with gout that has not been um, controlled for such a long time. Mm -hmm. And piglodicase has been uh, approved for about 11 years now and uh, has really been a, a major game changer for gout patients. That's correct. You know, I think part of the frustration of treating any kind of disease um, is when you just don't have the tools to be able to help patients. Mm -hmm. And that's not just frustrating for patients, but that's frustrating for doctors. Mm -hmm. So piglodicase is actually a real game changer because all of these patients that have had uncontrolled gout, patients who continue to have uric acid levels above six milligrams per deciliter, patients who continue to have flares, and patients who have evidence of topacious deposits can all get a treatment now that um, is very effective at eliminating, um, at, at, at eliminating this, uh, this uric acid deposition. Mm -hmm. And um, at Horizon, um, we're not just interested in resting on our laurels uh, with the kind of therapy that we have now for gout, but we're always looking for ways to make this therapy more effective, um, and we're always looking for new therapies to also treat uh, this uh, this disease condition. Mm -hmm. On on that note, is um, is there anything else you'd like to leave us with today? Well, like I said, um, I think that the most important things to understand uh, for uh, for any uh, 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 healthcare professional is that, you know, gout is not what we thought it was, that it's just limited to joints and it's just intermittent in nature. It's systemic, it's ongoing, and it's progressive. And, um, and it has the potential to um, really uh, worsen a lot of comorbid conditions that these patients have, including their cardiovascular disease, 
hypertension and, um, and metabolic syndrome. Mm -hmm. And what is the mortality rate for patients with these complications uh, without kidney disease? And mm -hmm. Right. I mean, mortality rate for patients with kidney disease is extremely high, especially for patients whose kidney disease um, has advanced to end stage and now they're requiring dialysis. We're looking at mortality rates of 15 to 20% per year. And, um, and it, unless we are able to deal with um, mitigating all of the risk factors that lead to progression of cardiovascular disease and chronic kidney disease, um, that uh, mortality rate is not going to be able to, uh, to improve. Well, on that note, Dr. Martyr, um, I would like to thank you for your time. We look forward to following your work and talking with you again. Thank you, Amy, for the opportunity to talk to you today and to uh, make my thoughts uh, known to, uh, to your network. I really appreciate the time. Thank you.